and we are live. Let me double check. Yep, we are live. So, welcome everyone. Today we're going to be doing a podcast where we discuss team fight. Respectively, the main topic of this podcast is like what makes a hero strong in Dominion. And given that in the recent meta, most heroes have been picked due to their team fighting capability, the resulting main point will be just what makes a hero a strong team fighter. So, in order to find that out, we're just going to break down everything that has to do with a team fight and understanding. So, first of all, I would like to welcome our special guest for today. We have the professional player, Mr. Setmix. Welcome. We have uh, Mr. Freeze, the objectivity person in this community, the the knowledge expert, the right, that's how good it is. And we have <laughs> <laughs> Okay, and we have Mr. Filthy Spaniard, the Hello. official CEO of For Honor Dojo. Welcome oh, everyone. Yeah. I thought you were going to end, you were just going to say the official CEO of For Honor and then like <laughs> really, really ramp it up. It's like, yeah. Official CEO of For Honor Competitive. Oh, hell yeah. And I've also got my cat in the corner as well, so Noodles can join in. She probably will yell at some point because she does does do that whenever I talk on any kind of screen. Oh, I'm disappearing, it's reappearing on the stream. Uh, no worries. It's all right, it's all right. So I think it's. Time to just start into it. Like, uh, I'm just going to be saying the discussion points and just all going to give our thoughts and ideas on the question. So, first question is what is a team fight? We're going to be talking about team fight. We need to even at least understand what this is. Okay, I'll, right. I'll, 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 I'll you start. Set us off. Okay, I, I'll set it off. I think a team fight is a gathering of people that uh, attack each other and have an objective. And I, I think the point of a team fight is to kill the enemy and achieve that objective. And if achieving that objective is best done through killing that opponent, then that is your main objective. Yeah, I, I, I mean, that's... Do you need an objective? I think it's so. just basically forced on you. I mean, why are you fighting in the first place? What are you trying yeah, to achieve? But fight? if somebody wants to fight that, you kind of have to take it, right? You can try disengaging, but the objective then is to disengage, but the objective is just forced on you. Ideally, you have a objective with the team fight that you initiate. Well, I think our cams are frozen, so we're other okay. than you. Um, Mostly right. when you go into out of Discord, it decides to pause the. There we go. Yeah. Um, well, I think. Well, first of all, you got like the team fights are normally considered balanced, but so if you have a one v two, it's not a team fight. I think that's fairly straightforward. Um, so, but I think like a three v two still counts as a team fight, um, and often obviously they evolve backwards and forwards. So, so so I guess numbers are. Uh, from a numbers perspective, it's just anything more than a 1v2 with a team fight, I would say. Um, yeah. but I do think there are different objectives because you have scenarios where you, well, like a team fight in mid is a very different kind of objective to a team fight on a point. And it's all, it all happens within the context of the game. Like you should be um, trying to, I've just realized what my, the other card will cut out of me in the background. So I'll just move that so you can't see two versions of Spaniard. <laughs> I won't get. I won't get to that. <laughs> um, so, like in mid, like you, in first team fight on Citadel Gate, it's a very different objective to a team fight when you are trying to recapture a point and you're about to be breaking, for example. I think. And uh, I think uh, not every team fight needs to have a goal. There is bad team fights that people and teams take, and you can see the matchmaking all over the place where people just have a fight for the sake of it. So, team fights don't really need to have a goal. Yeah, that's fair enough. Um, but in a comp game, you'd expect most team fights to have some kind of objective, right? You would expect them to, unless you play with Legion. 
<laughs> just disengage, let the man die, right? Yeah, basically. Yeah. No, but I mean, like I said before, if the if the team body is just bad, your objective is basically to disengage, get away from. You don't even want to like finish the fight, right? But no. that's a whole well, different story. Will they let you? It's not like the whole objective of playing Dominion to make the enemy team to break and kill them. And to achieve that, you need to get points. So in order to team fight, you are doing a proactive activity to get those points. So be it fighting in mid, you are fighting to win mid to generate points. So every team fight that you take is you trying to achieve point generation somehow. Yeah, yeah. I mean that's fair enough. But the team that can be done in a way that doesn't necessarily require killing all the people. So if you are, I don't know, I'm just gonna come up with some idea here. Like you're, you're about to be reaching a thousand points. You're not quite there. You need to get your your team needs to boost up to to get a thousand points. So you leave one person on a home point to boost, and then the rest of you take a team fight where you try and keep the opponents away from the other objectives. You're not really trying to win that team fight. You're trying to keep them alive, really, until you start breaking them, and then you can kill them. So, in a way, that's a, that's a, that at the moment, that's a different kind of team fight. In, well, to me, that... to me, it just sounds like that team fight just has a different objective. Like in that situation, yeah. you've already achieved your initial objective, which was to make them breaking, which is the objective that you start with, and then afterwards is to kill them as easy as possible. And by not killing them before they're breaking, well, you achieve your follow-up objective easier. But in general, we need to understand, like we understood the idea of a team fight. Like the, the objective of a team fight is to generate to find ways to generate points. But how do you generate points? Like through points, through side points that give you points. So you have A, B, and C. But here's the thing: if you win a team fight on B, well, that can lead to more things. That could lead to you actually being able to engage on C and winning even more points. So the question is, how many, uh, how, how many, how many objectives do we take into account while team fighting? Like I go in B on Citadel. What, what, what is my thought process? Am I just fighting for mid, or am I fighting for more? Am I fighting to uh, cripple my enemy team so I can maybe make a push and even win more points? And I think, isn't that the difference between the best teams and like the teams who are slightly below her, that that the best teams take the the viewpoint of the whole match and they're looking all the time to maximize their um, their point generation and their their impact on the whole game, whereas the teams that aren't as good, where they just focus on the on the moment to moment kind of stuff. and then and then they, like Samek said, take team fights which are bad because they're not thinking about the overall context of the match. Um, sure, but if you if you think too far ahead, I'd say it can lead to a lot of failure because you you want to win this one and then I do this right and then we yeah. push. If this and this happens, and then all of a sudden this doesn't happen, and people are stumped all of a sudden. So I think it takes it doesn't not practice experience like everything. It takes so much to be able to translate a team fight into like three steps forward into we then we take this, then we do that. Because the options are just are just too big to do that. Because I think people might overreach them. Obviously, if you can do that, that's amazing. But I don't think yeah. a lot of teams can do it or even will reach a point to be able to do that. Even our best teams probably can't do it consistently. Yeah, and I think they probably have... fail more often than not when trying to do that. Yeah, I think they. I think they have to be mindful of what the future objectives will be, and then flexible enough to go for those. So I think a good example of that is when you see the first team fights on Temple. Oh, sorry, not Temple on um uh, Sanctuary Bridge, and I noticed like in particular Nemesis and um, Mini Mices now I guess as well will like they the way they they stop almost before the team fight is finished and send one person to push the home point as soon as they have, they feel like they've got an advantage enough to move on to the next objective before this objective is even, the, the objective of winning the team fight is even finished, if that makes sense. 
Yeah. When is the team fight concluded? That's basically the question for a lot of teams. Some say, oh, we need to kill everybody. Others say, oh, we have three people really low. The team fight is basically over. They can't do anything. So now we do make the next step. So I guess that's another question. Yeah. I think we are focusing a lot on the macro goal of the team fight. Like we are saying that we need to win this team fight to get mid lane, but how do we achieve getting mid lane? Like uh, we're, we have to kill minions, but we also have enemies fighting us. Would it be easier to just try to fight them and kill minions at the same time? Or would it be easier to kill the enemies and then kill minions? How do you decide on these decisions? Oh, I'm surprised. Would you actually prioritize killing minions and not just have killing minions as a side product of the team fight itself? Considering like team fighting characters have the big hitboxes, you just kill minions automatically, right? It's really dependent on the character you're playing. Most characters, if you're playing, normally you send characters that have mid lane options to mid anyways, and when they fight in minions, they're usually clear minions at the same time, so... Yeah, you, you don't really focus on minions too much, you just focus on winning the team fight because that gets you superiority on the map. I mean, I like... Obviously, I can't, from my own personal experience, I tend to try and position myself so I can hit minions if I'm hitting... if I'm. If I'm playing Raider, you know, I'll come in and rather than running in from the back of a team fight, I might run in from the side so that my zone will, when I st if I start off with a zone, it'll, k you know, kill 10 minions at the same time. But obviously, I'm personally not a competitive player. So uh, I might be doing it completely wrong. And, you know, Sam but Samix, you've been playing, you played some JJ, right, in the, in the finals. So how would you position yourself as JJ? Would you prioritize is there a position in a team fight where jj is stronger um for team fighting the killing the players versus for killing minions and which one do you prioritize when you start off in on sanctuary bridge for example well it's really dependent on your teammates positioning as well and you really want to look for your target first because normally you assign someone you focus on and if there is a way you can stand that is advantageous for you and also clear minions, then of course you would choose that position, but you don't always have that option. So if you don't have that option, that's okay, as long as you can cover your teammates and lock that person down. And you really just want to win the team fight first. It's more important. Well, why is it more important to win the team fight first? Like, isn't the... Well, okay. If you win the team fight first, you have multiple opportunities to go from there. If you don't win the team fight, you basically have to reset and you don't get much from it. Maybe you get mid, but most likely your opponents will push it back after they respawn. So your best option is really just to win a team fight well, get get yourself some good options. Maybe you can push the enemy home point. You can safely clear the clear uh, the minions, go back to heal, come back and hold mid without just losing it immediately. So I think it's just a better option. And of course you get more renown if you kill the enemies. To so. me it sounds like if for you, if you're not winning the team fight, you're going to lose mid afterwards. But what about the idea of just clearing mid and stalling that team fight as long as possible? Wouldn't that achieve your objective of uh, getting as many points as possible? That without depends having on the player to kill skill, people? I would say. It depends on the player skill, I would say. If you're someone like Minimeisters, who's like really good when it comes to defending and stalling, then maybe you could pull that off. But if you play with someone who is not as consistent when it comes to defending, then I would not really recommend it. Well, don't you even have an to... advantage if you have minions on your side? So you technically, if you have advantage. an advantage, you just want to aim to get those minions, get the enemy minions, and then you force your opponents to fight in your minions? I would agree with that, but if your opponent is just better than you in team fights, then I, I would not consider it that much of an option. I think you really need to be solid at defending for that to work. Because if you just eat attacks over and over and you get too low, you need to go heal, you lose teammates, you're going to lose the fight and it's going to spiral and they're going to get mid lane afterwards. I don't see that as a good option. I think it's better to kill them off and get the renown from that. Yeah, but and it's not less because, sorry, sorry uh, if you can actually stall a team fight, keep the minion lane, stop them from clearing. If you can do that, why not just kill them off straight away? Because you're clearly the better team then. Because I don't think yeah. that's I don't think doing that is necessarily harder than killing them off. I think killing them off might take more effort oh, than clearing okay. minions while fighting and then not allowing them to clear minions. Because to me it sounds like in order for them to clear minions, they have to do input. They have to open themselves up through an attack, which can be punished. 
Yeah, I guess there's the other the other thing is that it's that you know, it prevents you moving on to the next objective. You know, if you holding mid is good, but sometimes you want to cap both side points. Well, well, what what um, is that? Why is that an objective? Why would that even be an objective? Your objective is to make the enemy break, and you make the enemy break by generating the most points. And if you have mid and your home point, you generate points more than them. Like it might be, because it's not just about generating points. It's also about it's about specifically about generating more points than the opponents before they can get to the same point as well. So if they're, if you're doing this scenario, right, that you're, you're holding mid and your home point and you're constantly having a team fight where you're stalling out, you're not really aiming for kills and you're just preventing them from counter clearing, right? You're going to have to have one guy probably going backwards and forwards to your home point to heal every now and again and or protect against back cap attempts and your opponents potentially can have one person on their point boosting as well. So when the when your team gets them gets them to breaking you they will have close enough points that they aren't too far off breaking either so it's generally better to have a triple cap or a double cap that then they have to force you have they have to uh, do an unfavorable um team fight on one of your points that you you're held so that you end up with a bigger point advantage so that you it's easier for you to keep them in breaking when you get to the breaking Does that make sense well i'm not sure if, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure i'm not sure i was it follow... Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You you give I'll, an I'll, example I'll... and I'm <laughs> you talk. No, I'm sorry. I'll let you I'll let I'll let you do let you let you I'll let you respond. I'm sorry. I'm just I'm just being facetious. Okay, I'm not fully sure I follow on your example. Like you, you brought up the point that yes, if you're generating points and you get them to breaking, well, they might be close to breaking as well. So yeah, that is true. And that is really map dependent and how many points you have and how much you can generate. But to me, it sounds like if you still have mid, then you are at an advantage. And you gave the example, okay, they're contesting my point. So now we are stuck. And then they have someone boosting. And th this was where like it dropped because if they have someone boosting, then I'm in a 3v2 in mid. Or alternatively, I can send someone to their point just like they did to me. And now I'm fighting 2v2 in mid. I'm keeping this strategy where I have mid and generating points and not allowing them to clear. Because if they clear, they open themselves up, which give me opportunities to do damage for them. So... Yep. Overall, like my point is just to get points, and I can do this by defending mid. So isn't that the thing that every team should be aiming for? And where is the team fight basically in mid? Are you because I thought the whole time you pushed past your minions, past the lane, and then fight in front of them basically. But like you said, you give them the chance to clear, and then punish them for attempting to clear. Right? So you're fighting in your minions after all. Well, I don't want them to clear, but yes, I'm fighting in my mains. Let's all get like you the same mental. Clear, but you want them to attempt to clear. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't want them. I don't want them to clear. But if they attempt to clear, my job is to maximize how much uh, how much they get punished for clearing, so they are not going to try to clear. Basically, my question would have been: Can you even manage to hold B then, the minion lane, if they get chances to clear? Because with the boost and how minions spawn, you know, when you boost, the more minions spawn and all that kind of stuff. I, I think it's much harder than just killing them off. I don't know why you think it's... Yeah, I, think it I, don't, I don't know. It's just, just my <laughs> general really feeling. I think that right. your strategy requires so much more coordination and su such specific things in, in each position. It's, I don't know. I think it's much harder than just killing them off, yeah? It's also that there's one important thing to remember. It's that one thing into the late game, there's one specific thing that keeps winning team fights, and it's feats. And you get feats through getting renown. If you just keep stalling one fight in mid lane the whole time, you're not really generating much renown. It's much better if you get both side points and then try to get renown off of that. Yeah, I think well, we are getting a little bit sidetracked into this specific example, but I think the overall sort of take home message is that you need to think about. The, you, each team fight within the context of the entire match and the objectives of that individual team fight with how it's going to impact the entire match can can affect how you will play that individual team fight. 
So a team fight where you want to kill the enemy as quickly as possible is going to play out very differently to a team fight where you want to stall the enemy for a bit longer or that kind of, that kind of thing. Does that? I think are we are we agreed on that. I feel like that's fairly reasonable. Okay. So can we finally answer the initial question? What is a team fight in like one two sentences? Well, go on, freeze. Take the first one from this oh. one. <laughs> Everything basically not a gang situation, not a 1v1, is a team fight. So anything that is 2v2 plus? Exactly. Or at least 2v2? Yeah, I think so. Oh. Um, yeah, that, that's a good definition. Yeah. Would you consider my example where I'm in the minions and I'm, I'm not engaging at all and you are trying to clear my minions a team fight? I think you Yes, could... you don't need to attack, right? It doesn't require attacking or defending or anything. If you just if you have someone I don't know, bound, but if you have someone basically if you force someone into a position, it, it, is, it is a how do I put this? It is a fight after all, yeah. Yeah, they're they're in... you force someone not to do something what he actually wants. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Well you, they, they have an objective that they're trying to complete with their team which is clearing minions, and you have your team trying to prevent them doing that objective. So you're having, a, you're having a fight over an objective with a team. So I think that's a team fight. I think that is a good definition. And I think we're going to have to move to the next question, which we kind of talked about in this question, but I'm going to say it anyway. What is the scope slash objective of a team fight? I think we definitely covered that one. <laughs> um, okay, I mean, it's, then it's not, it's not strictly it. about killing, right? Yeah, you kind of whatever your goal is, keep them there, get them low, let them actually escape. Maybe they don't have a heal point. You're fine with them running around at 10 HP if they don't have any like point to heal on, right? So yeah. then you want that team fight like this. You don't have to kill them necessarily. So. Whether you want a team fight depends on many different things. And it's for you to decide whether you want that or not. It's not necessarily, oh, we killed everybody. That is a one team fight. It doesn't have to be. Yeah. I think you can think of it in terms of, as well as, well as like your, your objectives of the team fight, you can think of it a little bit in terms of resource management, resource allocation. Like you, at any point on a map, at any point in a match, your team has a certain amount of resources, which is to say, the health of your players, the feats you have available, your your sources of renown that you are able to generate, and your sources of points you are able to generate, and all of those you can consider as a kind of resource bank that you have. And you're always trying to keep your opponent's resource bank as low as possible and keep your resource bank as high as possible. So if in a team fight where you you can you can consider a team fight one if your opponents are all super low and have no way to go and heal and generate points, then you've successfully won that you've won that team fight, really, already, unless they're able with what little they have left to turn it around, which obviously can always happen, but it's I think the way that players tend to play at the top level, the comp level is much more conservative and less risk taking. And so if the team only has a small amount of resources left, they've only got a little bit of health, they don't tend to throw themselves onto the gr into the grinder in the hope, in the like, you know, the outside hope that they will manage to kill all of their opponents who are at full health without landing a single hit. That doesn't happen. They go and change their strategy. They go and heal or they go and find somewhere to freeze underscore advice MP3. Um, Okay, well, we should... you want you want to repeat that line for us, Freeze? I think I think that's no, important. no, because yeah. it's going to be misconstrued once again. <laughs> Can't do that. I say so. Yeah, basically, it... what he's referring to is that if you have if you're low HP, you have no way of healing. You just jump off somewhere and kill yourself. That's what he's referring to. Yeah, it's just uh, we we generate. It's we're, we're working on a Freeze soundboard uh, app. It's gonna it's gonna hit the it's gonna be good. Yeah, I think a throw on a soundboard in general would be pretty awesome. Right? Well, I think here, now that you introduced the resource management into the discussion, I think now you've created multiple objectives for a team fight. 
you have the initial objective that we talked about which is making the enemy team break by gathering points and now you also have a resource gathering which is basically getting fit or having your players be at full hp or in their best possible position yeah i think that's it. the resources is, is a is a step down from uh the objectives it's like how you achieve those objectives and you need resources to achieve your objectives and so that is does that make that make sense yes that makes a lot of sense so it's not a primary objective you don't need this to win but you are gonna going to win easier if you complete this side objective first yeah yeah it's it it's a it's a hierarchy of needs as it were you know one feeds into the other I don't know. I mean, I'm getting a bit too too theoretical here at that point, but you know, we've called it the, the fighting th team fighting theory. So I'm gonna, I'm, you know, we've got full yeah. range you know, as pie in the sky, you know, wearing academic hats and stroking our beards, that kind of thing as we want. Um, so right now, like we were talking about uh, the best way of achieving that scope, and right now we're, we were talking about resource management. So right now, would you say that the best way of achieving the original scope which was making them break is get fits and then use fits as a resource trade and out trade them with your resources yeah okay. definitely i don't know about yeah. the best way of doing it but it's it's, it's certainly a isn't it? isn't it that's what people tried to avoid back with the uh, defender renown yeah no I, we, we do we can't absolutely not feed any renown we can't feed the renown i was like the main objective so and once they have defeats, it just you know the, the usual snowballing. You can't yeah. do anything if you're on your tier two, and all of a sudden you get fury flask, right? Like get three minutes in or some shit. I mean, there's a there's a play around it. Sometimes you bait them to use a feat, for example, um, and you can sort of uh, what's the word? Neutralize one of their objectives because you know feats, whilst they are. Big, big powerful tools they tend to be big powerful tools that can be misused and you'd certainly see people like look like they're gonna throw a, a a flask and then their opponents pop phalanx and then they don't throw the flask and then they wait and then they throw the flask and that's yeah of... but in that example you have tier, tier fours on both yeah. sides right but you don't even want to be in the position of being behind in feats, right? And having to be, you know. No, it's not. It, it was more of a, a caveat to I'm that than a, than a straight rule. Yeah, definitely. But yeah, you do want your feats, first and foremost, I think. That should be one of the main goals at the beginning. Even if you're slightly behind or on par in score, if you are ahead in feats, you can translate that much easier into a win than the other team that didn't unlock their feats. Yeah. Um, I think I don't know how much that has changed with the recent Dominion um, tweets, because obviously defender renown is significantly less now, and it's easier to gain renown even if you're not doing very well. Um, I had a really really horrible match the other day in solo queuing, where I didn't get a single kill. Um, uh, in fact, I don't think anybody in my team did. It was really really bad, but I still ended up on my tier three because I was managing to contest and clear minions in a few in a few places so it, previously i think that would have been the kind of match where i would have wouldn't have got a tier one but now nowadays it seems a little bit easier to do that kind of um to to come to, to at least have some renown even if you're losing badly um is that have you noticed that changing in recent scrims barrack or semix because i haven't been scrimming I also haven't been screaming. I've been playing much more. <laughs> <laughs> I, like, I realized when I said that. I was like, wait a second. Uh, <laughs> have people have people been saying that um, they've noticed that in scrims in that case? Uh, well, I've definitely noticed myself. What you the phenomenon you've talked about, where like if you are actually winning in team fights, you're not going to get that big of a resource advantage as before by not getting your fits as much as before because the way you generate renown has changed. And has changed in a way where if you win a lot in a stomp, you're not going to snowball in terms of fits. 
Yeah. I mean, to be honest, that's probably a good thing for the health of the game, and it means that the maybe the um, <laughs> been screaming at Elden Ring. Yeah, no, I've been that's I've been doing Elden Ring scrims as well. Yeah. Um, thanks, babes. <laughs> uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought. I think somebody else take over quickly. Okay, yeah. you, you've said, you've said... I think it's much more even now. I both teams seem to be unlocking feats. Obviously, not that exact same rate but you don't have these discrepancies anymore where one team has like a tier four and the other team has a i don't know just tier one here and there it might happen sure if like somebody's like really stomping and winning every one v one also but i don't i think it's much more even the the process of unlocking feats the, the mm. time frame it happens so do you think that in changes our working theory of team fights to make the kind of resource management in the terms of renown, less important, and you can well, focus more on. No, the- it's just I help. think people are still figuring it out. Fair enough. Because what you can hear is a lot of complaining while screaming, like why have they removed this and run and run? What's so good? Why do they dare change anything? You know how it is. So I, th- I think it'll require not just time, but also the willingness of the current team screaming to try new things. Yeah, I mean, they, might, they might not like it. It's fair enough, but I think it'll take a little bit of time. But they'll figure it out. Yeah, I think that is certainly a footnote that should be put down uh, for this this discussion as a whole. Is that we are in a period of time where the mechanics of Dominion have changed, and the pre- it has been multiple years of it staying exactly the same, with the only changes being how certain char- new characters have all ha- introduced on different feats, that kind of thing. And now we have got a change in the core mechanics of Dominion, which we haven't really seen the full implications of yet, because there haven't been really many major tournaments with the new rule set. Um, so it's possible that all of the the team fighting stuff that we're talking about now will change, or at least some of it will change. So as to have maybe yeah like i said maybe less focus on renown more focus on killing minions to gain points or whatever um so yeah just wanted to put that one out there i think this change has changed the your overall scope in a game because i think right now you still have the side objective of gathering feats but because you can do it so much easier passively without actively trying to uh, take team fights or take any activity in just getting fits, then you can worry about other things more. You can give more prioritization to just getting as many points as possible because you know that you're going to get your fits anyway, sooner or later. So, yeah. so thus, I think that fits have lost value as a resource. You, right now, re- other resources are more important than fits because fits are going to be achieved anyway. Just a, li- just a bit slower than your enemy. Yeah, yeah I, I, can see, I can certainly see that. Um, I mean, there, there, there is still a significant amount more renown you get from kills and kill streaks than, um, than not. So in a way, team fight, you know, you will get a... You might not be as far ahead, but you will still be ahead if you get a team fight win and you kill everybody in that case maybe it's the other way around and we were talking about how it's better to leave a team low health and not able to do things maybe it is better sometimes to go for kills maybe in the early game um to maximize the chance of getting on a kill streak and um and that kind of thing what are your or, thoughts emix I, I agree with that we can take the example from blitz in the chat how he calls the new meta, because I think that kind of ties into it. He said, yo, the enemy team has four people going negative and they are headed points. Doesn't that automatically mean you took the wrong fights? Your team fight objectives were wrong. Yeah, I'd say. Yeah. Isn't that exactly what that would mean? Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, basically, we're saying you're bad, Blitz. Uh, is that, is exactly, that- that's what I'm saying. <laughs> No, I I don't With think that's necessarily true. 
I, I think both these two teams, like these two teams have different objectives. One team objective was to just win team fights and the other was to prioritize points. And before winning team fights would get you f really fast feats, which make it, would make it really easy to win even more team fights, which would make it really easy for you to get map control. But right now, winning team fights is not the only thing you need to get do to get map control. Right now, I think you need to put way more effort into just getting map control and put getting feats, which can be translated into winning team fights with the objective of getting renown on a second layer. Whereas before, I can say even like as our strategy in Nemesis, our first priority when we start the game is to get as many feats as possible. Whereas in the, this new meta, I don't think that is the case anymore. Mm -mm. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. So I guess in that in that sense, you might consider the main resource that you're wanting to get an advantage on is probably overall health totals rather than renown per se. Can we identify all the resources? Like I'm a bit confused on what is a resource. Fair enough. Um, well, I would say you, your team's health overall your team's number of players that can be effective overall as well. Because if you have one player who's at 10 health you're, and everybody else on full health, you, in theory, ha might have more health than your em entire opponent's team, which is all at half health. But you're going to be less effective because that one guy who's on 10 health can't do anything because he'll die. Um, so there's, there's th those aspects. And then we have still got, we still feats obviously still are an important resource and feet cooldowns play into that as well. You want to make sure you get the most uses of your feats in in the time available. If you do get if you do manage to get feet early, getting two uses of fire flask is way better, way more value um, than just one use of fire flask. And there is also the aspect that you need to make sure, since both teams get their tier fours, most likely you need to make sure that you time your tier four accordingly to what your opponents do. So, like, if just for example you have a phalanx and your opponents have a fire flask, you want to make sure you don't want to use your phalanx before the fire flask, so you want to save it for it and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, timing as well. Would you consider position positioning to be a resource that you can? Um, in, that you can maximize within a team fight. I think first no. of all, for... okay, positioning is not a resource. Okay. The players inside the team fight are a resource. Their health bars are a resource. Maybe even revenge is a resource. Their feats are a resource, but their positioning is not really a resource. Okay, isn't a resource just anything that improves your effectiveness to being able to win a team fight? Uh, something you can spend or trade against yes. the resource well, of the other team. Would you say that you cannot apply that to a position? Like whenever you attack, know, you move out position, of that position, so you trade that position for the damage. ground, maybe I don't know area. I don't know. Not well, that, well, that, well, that definitely style, is a resource. I don't know. Uh, very abstract one. And very I think I think I don't I don't think it's abstract. It's just very hard to quantify. Whereas fits, you see, oh look, I have this many fits. But with yeah. resources, it's hard to understand what resource gives you what advantage. But to me, position is a resource because it improves your effectiveness in a team fight. Yeah, that's why that's why I, I mentioned it. So I was thinking along along those lines. Obviously, it's you're right. It's much more difficult to quantify. Whereas you know, in theory, you could have a readout of all your health totals. And on no, the, on the priority list, I think it's really far down. Yeah, sure, could make a difference, but it's also that the position always fluctuates. You yeah. can't really stand uh, still. So I'm leaning towards set mix. Okay. Isn't isn't that trading your resource, which in this case is position, for I don't know whatever you do to trade that resource? In that case, you Kinda, attack yes. and you go trade your resource for an attack. Kinda yes, but since it's constantly fluctuating and constantly changing, it's really hard to say because it's to some extent out of your control. So 
it can be. I guess it's a, really a question of philosophy, <laughs> yeah. but I'm really not sure here. Okay. Okay. Shall we dig into positioning in that case? Because we've talked a lot about the macro importance of team fights and what, how the impact they have on a match, but we haven't yet really gotten into the the nitty gritty of how a team fight itself plays out in 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 the individual even individual team fight. If that, if that makes any sense. So. What are your priorities when positioning your team for a team fight set mix? It uh, kind of depends on the characters that they're playing, but generally you want to make sure... There's a few fundamental things you want to look out for, of course. Things like you don't want teammates standing behind you so, you so the opponent can lock onto them and then you can parry any of their attacks or their hitboxes get a little weird, so... There's a few general things to look out for, but it's really contextual. I'm, I'm not sure how to generalize it. Yeah, I think it's kind of neat to watch when you uh, when somebody is uh, streaming uh, Brawl scrims, 2Z scrims, because there's a lot of complaining, oh, why are you there? Why did you position here? Or you're too far away there. I think 2v2 is because it's practiced so much. Positioning has a much higher impact compared to like a complete 4v4 fight in mid with minions that will stop you moving to certain positions and you need to line up the, the, the lock on you know you want two people behind each other so you hit the most amount of people it's, it's much harder to control than in twos but in i think next time someone uh screams twosies just just watch that and i think you get a, a good idea of that yeah i mean i think that it doesn't necessarily mean it's less important i think that just means that because there's Fewer parameters when there's only four players in a two in a two v two. That it's much easier to 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 get your head around the positioning and 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 work work with it, right? Whereas in a team fight where there's eight players plus minions plus the map isn't just a big space, empty space. You've got you know geometries and and hazards and all the all the other kind of things. And you always think about points as well that it's much harder to think about positioning. But I don't think it makes it any less important. I think it's just more difficult because there's more more things in motion. But you mentioned uh, your character. You, it depends on characters, that makes. Which characters, if like if people are going to be uh, tuning in for like little tidbits of information, which characters position where in a team fight? So let's say you've started, you're in um, Citadel Gate, you start off. You basically start off with your lineup, four across facing each other. What order do you put people in, and that kind of thing? Um, you don't necessarily put them in order. Like you go left, you go right. You most in our case, we used to give them like we we gave everyone a main target to focus on, and then we would just make sure that they locked them down, peeled them, and made sure that they're in range of them, because that made things a little easier. In that case, you didn't have to look for every t single teammate and just look for that one target peel that one target, attack that one target. Except for, of course, when there were situations where you could target swap, of course, but we're not going to get into all of that specifics. So the fundamentals were just you had your one target. Um, and when there were specifics for positioning, there were just things like if you played JJ, for example, you didn't want to be too close to walls because your hitboxes would easily get you hit, hit the walls and then you would be stuck in a stupid recovery and things like that. So, yeah, it's really like that. Okay. I mean, to me, it sounds like positioning is all about just maximizing your effectiveness while minimizing your opponent's effectiveness. And having someone lock down someone else, that is just like a direct minimization of someone's effectiveness. And it's like super easy to perform where like, if let's say we give a harder example where you're fighting a black prior, so you have to like rotate around him to minimize his flip capability well that is just way harder to pull off so i think people just found the easiest way to just lock take someone down and make sure he's not attacking your teammates and you're not attacking his teammates or if you are you have only little little opportunities that you can take advantage of yeah in the chat saying that you are looking kind of Evil and lighting in the dark. Should I turn on the lights? Is that what they're saying? <laughs> I think I think they want you to turn on the lights. Yes. 
<laughs> in a second. <laughs> but no, I think you're right. I think you're all right, Barak. I think you've got um a good point with the 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 about sort of the area of effectiveness of characters um and the the way that you each player can influence their that oh it's, it plays in with what Seneca was saying about having a target that you pick that like or you're you're assigned one opponent that you have to lock down which makes it a lot more easy to um i guess to to keep that in mind but it also means that you've got this um I'm really yellow now Okay. And you come back. You come back to being a, a not full pale. That, that sounded weird. <laughs> oh, do you want the cam back? Was it noodles? Okay, all right. Noodle, noodle cam back on again. Okay, there we go. Jeez. I think we misunderstood a little bit of each other. You said that I mentioned area of effect. I, I didn't talk at all about area of effect. I just okay. talked about your effectiveness effective when you're positioning. Yeah. No, not, not effective. <laughs> I mean, okay. Sorry. Like, okay. Here, here's. Here's where the confusion is. Effect of area to me is that distance slash radius you can be effective in. While what I meant by position effectiveness of certain position is the advantage this position provides by being in it. Yeah. And I said that the main objective of positioning is to maximize your position effectiveness. So this position gives me as much value as possible. And to translate that in actual game terms, I am a Junjun player. I want a position that I can hit the most people at the same time so I get the most value. While yeah. the opposite would be I want to minimize the opponent's effectiveness. So the same example with Junjun, I want to keep him as far away from my teammates so he can get as little value as possible from his unblockables. Yeah, or force him into a corner so he's going to be bouncing against walls and that kind of thing. Yeah, so, no, that's, that's a very good point. So and that sorry sorry you, so, you, you, you go ahead I'll, I'll keep it no I was going to say that the because if that then leans into um, we can then start talking about what parameters each character has that make them more valuable in different positions and that kind of thing um, so you have characters like Janjun who have very big hit boxes and so they're very valuable when they can hit lots of players and then you have characters like um, Shinobi, who's very, very mobile, doesn't have many hitboxes himself, but he can move around enough that he can get a get that positional advantage a lot better, or a lot, a lot more easily. If that makes any sense, or he can yeah. manipulate positioning better. So, so, so that, that is mobility. Yeah. So mobility, kind of like, I guess, if I were to break it down into like two axes, you have your. Area of effect, your effective range, and then your ability to determine that range. That, okay, that doesn't make sense. Um, to get yourself in that range or position. Yeah, yeah. I get too stuck on the range thing. I I think there is way more to it. I think you have offensive, and your offense is determined by multiple things. It is determined by mobility, which determines how easy you can get into your ideal position to maximize area of effect then it is what i just said area of effect which is uh, the area in which you are effective in or like hitboxes and then there is also I, I would say pressure which is trying to quantify how effective are you in that area of effect of course yeah for some yeah. characters like that area of effect is also uh different along that area of effect you yeah. are more effective at this range than at this range, or maybe more effective at that range than this range. So you're trying to put yourself in a position where you maximize area of effectiveness. Yeah. Yeah, I think that that's a good point about the pressure is an important thing because you have characters like like Warden, for example, has crazy good range on his chargeable bash, which is it's which itself means that he's got good range. He should in theory have a large area of effect. But because when he lands his bash, he then is very vulnerable because he can be peeled from an opponent. His actual effectiveness is actual. His actual area. Sorry, I'm getting. We shouldn't. He's got great range, but his his area where he can be effective is significantly diminished by having opponents within those that area as well because they can peel against him. If that make if that makes sense. 
Um, so, so you're saying the further away he is while still being in a range, the higher his area of effectiveness increases, or no? The higher his pressure in that area of effectiveness increases. Yeah, I think his pressure is very decreased as long as there are multiple opponents overlapping his area of effectiveness. So I get his his area of influence becomes less effective. Okay. But, yeah. So 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 what what determines a hero's kit or effectiveness in a team fight? We have area of effect, we have mobility, we have pressure. What about peeling capability? Is that is yeah. that not something su that is super important? Like to to me many times until very recently team fighting was just about punishing people who press buttons. And yeah. that was correlated in peeling capability. I think that's a, it comes under sort of defensive area. Uh, so you have like offensive and defensive team fights, uh, uh, team fighting, as it were. And some moves are better for defensive team fighting, where you look for, you, you take advantage of openings that your opponents have created for you. But and there are other moves which allow you to make openings a bit better. And those ones. It, how, uh, how good each of those moves is is determined by how easy it is to be peeled against. So, for example, Jan Jun's uh, big sweeping unblockables are very strong in team fights because they can hit a large area, so they've got a big range, they've got a big area of effectiveness. They do damage the instant they hit the opponent, so they so it's not super easy to see it happening and then have an opponent to another opponent to interfere. So that's they they're so in a sense they they're fast to do damage, and then they are safe because he can recovery cancel into his Sifu stance to avoid counter attack. So that they're hard to peel against. So the safety, I guess, is how hard they are to peel against, or how how effective they are avoiding peel attempts. Um, and so then you have character like Zhan Hu, who's on dodgeable zone, makes him. It hits a large area, and it's going to be m more effective at peeling against characters with dodge cancels. So he then reduces the JJ's effective range, per se. I think to me, it sounds like you're trying to uh, quantify how strong a tool is by placing it in different categories. Could we try to identify all those categories that you can rank a character's move? Like here, I I'll start. For me, like the main ones that I see are hitboxes, range, speed, safety, and mobility. And damage. And, sp and special and damage, of course. And special properties. What wouldn't mobility automatically go into safety? Mm, I don't necessarily, because you can have a character that is very mobile, but they're one individual but they have like a, a move which has a long recovery and therefore it's I guess I guess that yeah, no maybe mobility. Are they mobile then if they have moves with Yeah, yeah. Or... It's um I guess mobility is a different part. It's not part of an individual attack. It's part of a character's kit. Whereas that the that would be an individual attack you call out the safety in like how easily they can become mobile after doing the attack. I call mobility your ability to reposition one while attacking because every attack has its movement and as we already agreed on, positioning is really important. So the right, ability right. to reposition while attacking that is huge. No, you're right. There's 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 I guess that's a diff that's slightly different to range is is about how much control you have over where your character ends up whilst doing the attack. So if you have a like a forward dodge attack, you're always gonna end up right in front of your opponent. If you have a big sweeping attack that allows you to move quite a lot whilst you're doing it, like JJ's heavies, he can he has he can or his light attacks, for example, you can move, you can backstep light, you can sidestep light, you can go forward with JJ's lights a, a long, you can move a long way. Whereas Shigoki's charging heavies, they've got a very big hitbox, but they're always going to hit exactly where Shigoki started from. They're not going to Shigoki can't take like three steps and hit somebody to the side with it. It's it's where he. So you're right. There is there. I I agree. There is a there is an aspect to which a move can have mobility. Maybe 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 mobility is not the right word for it, and it, we should call it like repositioning. But I do yeah. think it's still a, like repositioning is about mobility. 
Like it's the mobility yeah. of the move. But like mobility can be uh, interpreted as the mobility of the hero while moving. Like mobility can also be just how fast you are and how easy can you can rotate. Or mobility, how easy you can rotate from one position to another in a team fight. Like for example, Shinobi has high mobility because he has really easy capability of just going from point A to point B in a team fight with side dodges. Yeah. Anyway, I feel like I feel like we're just losing a bit uh the scope. <laughs> like what are we talking about? Why are we trying exactly to find out? <laughs> what does it all mean, Barry? What does it mean? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm trying to find that out because I don't know what I'm talking about either. I'm just throwing terms after the right. <laughs> we shouldn't be t we shouldn't tell them this. Like yeah. none of us really know what we're talking about. Yeah. But they, they shouldn't it's be all well rehearsed, well researched. Very well researched. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I yeah, just talk talking. and hope I find a point while talking. Maybe I don't. <laughs> Usually I don't, but yeah. There's something, there's something. Maybe like some smart people than ours can come along and clip the best bits and then arrange that into a montage that is like a book or something. No, but I think your points were right, the, the ones you listed, because you can clearly tell why the characters that are meta right now belong there. Because if you go point by point, the big hitbox is the mobility, you know, JJ, like you said, Shinobi. You can clearly tell that this is the reason why they are there. So I think your category is just fine. Okay, can we? So we, the beginning objective of this podcast was to understand what makes a strong team fighter, and we have now found five, six categories for how we can rank a hero's uh, abilities in a team fight, and we agreed on. We will have to rename mobility, but we agreed on hitboxes. Range, speed, safety, special properties, and however you want to call mobility, which is the repositioning ability while attacking. Can we try to? <laughs> All right. <laughs> can, we, can we try to rank That's this? the first one. Yeah. I'm glad nobody's bringing up, you know, making similar kinds of uh, comparisons about me. I me, mean, I, like, I don't, don't know what kind of grandma I end up looking like, but. So, yeah, thanks thanks for derailing it, uh, everything. Heart shot HD. Gah. Okay, as I was saying, can we try to rank it? Like, for example, I value very much safety in a hero. Because to me, that sounds like he can add input to the fight without being able to, like, lose his own, I don't know, resources for it. Yeah, yeah I agree with you. Um, I think that is... Well... If you have a lot of one of the problem is you need to have all of these um, or some you need to have some distribution of all of these properties, because if you only have one of them, you're still not going to be effective because a character. So a character with an immense pressure that does a lot of damage. Let's well, hit Akiri, for example, is a good example here, right? She Her mix up of the kick um, or the sweep or the faint to guard break does a lot of damage it's really hard to avoid uh you know it kill it but it but it's not safe so she's not an effective team fight and doesn't have very good range so even though she's got very good pressure or very good offensive potential doesn't have any good range and and it's not very safe so she's not a good team fighter because of that and warden is another example he's got great range it's good pressure it does good damage but it's slow to do to to have his damage of the shoulder bash, so he can be peeled against. Not not got safety. Um, whereas then you end up with characters who are very safe, but don't do anything. Like old Shinobi. I mean, it's less so nowadays because they're reworking characters that can, you know, becoming much more rounded and so on, um, and more more capable. But old Shinobi was incredibly safe, but couldn't do anything. So the safety didn't matter. Um, because there was nothing you could actually leverage this the his that safety to nothing he need nothing to make that no, nothing that he could use he could make safe with his kit it just didn't exist. Um, yeah, a lot of these points are interconnected with each other, right? JJ, the big hitbox, you hit five people around you. Of course, you had your teammate. It's automatically <laughs> safe because. Nobody can punish you for it, right? Yeah. 
So the big hitbox makes it automatically safe, even if you didn't have the recovery cancel with uh, Shifu afterwards, right? Yes. Yeah. So it's not just, oh, it's safe just because, I don't know, you get away from it. It's safe just because the other the other point, the other category is already so strong, it yeah. automatically plays into the others. Like one yeah. category boosts the other. So you could say it's similar for Shigoki with his charging heavies. They hit all around him in a 360 hitbox. So no one, it like, you can't get close enough to peel against him. So they're safe in that sense without having properties um, that in, in particular that make it safe. I guess the hyper armor makes it safer because it's harder to interrupt before it starts. Would you say that, would you say that um, properties like hyper armor that make a move harder to interrupt count as safety? Or are they different to safety? Because they because they 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 prevent you from they they allow you to 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 fulfill that attack, but they don't stop you from taking damage. It's about the objective. If, if yeah. your objective is dish out the damage, and then safety obviously is, uh, I don't know, Avoid damage. Yeah, uh, on the priorities is lower, right? So you can take the damage, it's just fine. Isn't safety like a determinant from your, for your opponent to attack you or try to punish you? So in this case, because you have hyper armor, even if he attacks you, he's not going to interrupt you. Thus, he is de he's not determined to attack you. He is less likely to attack you because his attack will do less. Thus, your attack is more safe. I don't know. That makes sense. Yeah, I think that. I think you. I think you could definitely put um, hyper armor into like into safety. Um, yeah, sure. Yeah, but you're right. But Jonesy makes a pretty good point in chat that it depends on the amount of health you have because obviously hyper armor doesn't do shit if you're not on any health to actually utilize that. So that's a very good point. But then, then that also. That's the same context as, as safety and other tools. Like, so dodge cancels are great, but when we had Orochi in the meta with the forward dodge on dodgeball all the time, actually it wasn't that great to have a dodge cancel because you could just, if you did a dodge cancel, you're going to get dodge lighted out of it. Because um, there's a tool that, that another character has that makes your tool of dodge cancelling less effective. So you're less safe in that sense. I guess there's safe as I guess so in that sense I guess safety can be on multiple different um avenues uh where you have you're safe against bashes but you're unsafe against undodgeables or you're safe against light interrupts but you're unsafe against bashes that kind of thing I mean it plays into what Barak said right safety being the the highest on the priority list and the nerf of Orochi basically being to his ability to punish all those really safe characters, right? So that's yeah. why he fell out of the meta. Yeah. So it makes very much sense. Yeah. yeah. Safety first. I say it's on safety the... first. Yeah, that's what safety saying. first. I like that. Yeah. Um, I think you could say it's on the opposite end of the spectrum to peel because peel is the ability to make enemies' moves less safe, punish their moves. So you've got safety one side, peel at the other side. But you can also see peeling as safety for your team. That is true. That is true. That's but very you, you gave a really good example that I want to get back to. Uh, you said that all Shinobi was very safe, but he couldn't get any value out of his safety. So I, I am trying to maybe conceptualize a formula to how to add value in a team fight. So... In this case, to me, it sounds like he was very safe, but his effectiveness, which let's say comes from his, I don't know, hitboxes, speed, range, whatever, was very low. So overall, his output was low. But yeah. there are the heroes that have high, high or good hitboxes, good range, blah, blah, and low safety. But their output is still low. So to me, it sounds like you have to f have like a good combination of these to have the highest output. You have to have good safety and you have to be able to uh, perform 
or to create value using that safety. And that safety determines how mu how much value you can create without being disturbed. Yes, I think that's I think that's a good point. And what Hartshard is mentioning is basically that in chat is, is basically that uh, you know in a dichotomy like. Would you rather have a high damage attack that's very punishing and easy to use, but very punishable and interruptible, or a very safe move that can, is very hard to stop but does low damage? Well, I think on the balance, you would ch you'd choose the latter because you, you're going to have that's many more opportunities to use that, and you will end up getting more value out of that the second move, which is very safe to use. Um, and, and an example, we'd have to go further back in the history of the game to find examples that are really one way or the other because the way the game has been balanced is improving a lot of these things. But but an example for an old move that did a load of damage but was really, really unsafe was Raider's old chain zone. I mean, to a certain extent, his current chain zone is pretty unsafe, but uh, he's got more mix-up of it and it, did le it does less damage now. Um, and his defense is better in general. His old chain zone, or Shigoki's old charged unblockable, you can just Would, say Hito's tearful. Yeah, Hito's tearful. That's another good one. Does crazy damage, um, but is super easy to stop. Just have somebody bash them out of it. Um, and where and that though Hito's tier four has never been effect. It's never been a particularly strong team fighting thing. You know, nobody cares about Hito's tier four for team fights. Whereas Nabushi's zone is was is low damage. But covers a large area. It's very, very safe because it hits all the way around her. It's very hard to stop because if it hit, hits on the side that she starts as, it, it hits very quickly. So that was very, that's very safe. And Nabushi, for a long time, was the strongest team fighting character in the game because of moves like that, like that and uh, Sidewinder and the very fast dodge cancel and that kind of thing. Um, so I think you could say that the. I guess you could say that the the damage and uh, hitbox and all that is the potential of a move, and then the safety is how much you can actually use that potential. And so it's yes. a fact you times it by, and then that's the total of how good that move is. Put things in mathematical terms. I can see Barak nodding, so I'm gonna. Yeah. gonna be like, I'm, I'm very happy with what he said. <laughs> you, you you translated what I said into actual terms, so thank you for that. But uh, overall, like we are trying to answer what makes a good team fighter. Would you say just a mix of good potential and safety? Is that is that the answer? Mm, yeah, yeah. I mean, positioning. I think mobility as well is super important. Um, I think that's a third factor as well because although it, it oh, I don't know, it plays into potential, right? Because you have. Oh, okay. And I forgot. And I forgot peel. There we go. So you need. You need. I think you need potential, which is how good the attacks are, but also how mobility plays into that. In that, how you how you can get into the area where you can use your attacks. So that that that's part of the potential safety, and then peel, which is your ability to make enemies' moves less safe. I guess mobility underpins both of those because again, you need to be in the position where you can peel your opponent too, like. Let me just um, look at Parrot now. Why is she now breaking into the meta? Because it's exactly what you just said. She's moving around a lot. It's extremely safe. Hitboxes are amazing. She can peel. You know, she's the perfect example for that. Yeah. Why all of a sudden, like a character from zero to hundred? Yeah. Um, I think she has. I think. To be honest, I think Pirate's kind of like you. Could, one could imagine a better team fighter than Pirate. Like, if for example. JJ had dodge cancels on top of everything, and his thing and his forward dodge heavy was unblockable and feintable, and he had a soft feint from his heavies into an opposite side light, and he had a, a low GB vulnerable dodge attack and everything else. Like you'd have pirate has, I mean, like, the, the way that current characters are designed tend to be they're mobile and they've got. They're mobile and safe, or they've got good hitboxes and are safe. Um, and I think that's like the two avenues that the that the, the devs go down. And then I guess you can call them one more offensive and more defensive yeah. um, team fighters. And you have the big orange moves, and on Parrot's side with uh, the hitboxes are actually unblockable moves. Yeah, so they're still amazing. 
Yeah. I mean, she's got the the dodge attacks are great hit great hitboxes, but they mm-hmm. are not. I I don't I wouldn't call the dodge attacks offensive moves because in themselves, I don't know. Do they, do they hit behind you faster than? Mm-hmm. I don't know. Yeah, like they hit behind you to the side. It's I don't know. I haven't tested specifically, but the hitbox on the dodge attack is absurd. Yeah, it is crazy. It goes all the way around you. Um, I'm just wondering if you use that offensively or you use that more as a peel tool. Um, I guess you can use it to get into offense because she has chain offense in her bash. Mm-hmm. So you can use it to off target. You can off target somebody else, use it to dodge. Get the opponent and block against one opponent who can who can only block it. They can't. Yeah, parry it's it. constant repositioning from her, and, and then, then once she sees the opportunity, she can just chain into whatever else she has, right? Yeah, it was sing- her offense right. being it's it's safe, yeah. high mobility, and the potential out of it is huge. Yeah. Would you rather have a giant hitbox and low mobility, or the opposite, small hitbox and high mobility? I think you would probably. I mean, they kind of play into each other, right? If we, we go, go back to talking about air of effectiveness, it's how... If it's, if it's small hitbox, but very mobile, then it can hit, actually it can hit a very large area. If it's a very large hitbox, but not mobile, then it can hit the area of the hitbox. So you can think of it almost like feats like catapult and arrow strike. Arrow strike... It's a smaller area, but it can it hits faster, so it's more mobile. Whereas catapult is a big area, but it hits really slowly, so it gives the opponent more time to move out of it. In a sense, it's less mobile. So the catapult is worse than than arrow strike, probably because or less effective than arrow strike because it doesn't because you can move out of the way very easily. So I'd say actually, I mean. It's a it's a balance, and that you can't you can't say what lo- high mobility and low hitbox or low hitbox and high mobility, because those two things combine into a single factor. I'd say, which is your overall air of effectiveness. All right. So, I think right now we have to take a step back and understand what we're talking about. We're trying to identify what makes a good team fighter, and we identified that the objective of a team fight is to get points. And we try to get points without having to kill people, but we came to the conclusion that you need to kill people. So right now, what makes a good team fighter is someone that is good at killing people. <laughs> and not getting killed while doing so. Yeah. While not getting killed while doing so. I... But, but I think there is like, it like fluctuates. Like if you have someone that is very good at killing people, then it creates more demand for someone who is good at not getting killed and so on and so on. Like right now we have really many heroes that just have really powerful offense. So that's why we value safety so much because we have uh, people that can do something about that offense while being safe at the same time. Or would you say that I got it wrong? So I think there's a it's not quite the same doing damage isn't the same as killing people i think that's i is i think that's the important that but your objective is to kill someone not to do damage no i think your objective isn't because like i said you, your objective is not always to kill someone you want to sometimes leave somebody alive at low, low health and they have they can't do anything so sometimes you don't want to kill people but you can't reach that without doing damage either so Either way, you've got to do damage to them. You just don't always want to do it, do the damage all the way. Sometimes you want to. Sometimes you want to just, uh, you know. Okay. Um, be safe. So your objective is to win the team fight, and you do it by decreasing the value the opponents can provide. In this case, since we got resource management into it, we decrease enemy resources, and we can do that multiple ways by. A, depleting enemy feats or trading your feats with their feats, hoping that you get a net positive trade. Or you can do damage to their HP, so their overall effectiveness, and in this case, resource, gets lowered. So 
like one big thing that I would, uh, I, I think the resource management uh, kind of fails in is like quantifying all the resources the same. Like for example, one HP does not always equal one HP in value. Yes, and yeah, I, I agree with you. I, I think it's very important to understand like how, how much value HP can bring at certain point. Like for example, if you are low, your value is going to bring way less. Like an instant example is like, we have two teams, they both have 300 HP. They have uh, three players on 90 HP and one guy on 40 HP. Well, the guy on 40 HP is going to bring uh, over for overall the team that is going to bring less value than if you had a team with 300 HP and four people on 75. So where am I getting at? How do you quantify a resource? Yeah, I I mean, that's it's really hard, isn't it? Because in your uh, HP example as well, does my team have a healing point? Because if I don't, if my team doesn't have a healing point, my HP obviously is worth much more. But if I have easy access to healing, then I can spend these resources quite easily, just replenish and go back. Right? So the the situation, like the whatever you're in right now, whatever the, the fight looks like, it changes so much. So you can't quantify, just HP is always more more important than feats. Like yeah. if I get my, I don't know, if I get my a perfect, I don't know, warmonger tier four off and die for it. Just because I had 10 HP, those 10 HP are perfectly worth it if the others take like whatever, 120, just because they need to disengage and are in a disadvantageous position then and get punished for it. So it, I, I don't think you can just have, oh, HP is always worth this. It's That's impossible to say. And yeah, I, I think agree. that goes for every resource. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And I think and I think moreover, that's also how the each individual team will... That That's the kind of flexibility... That each of in each of each individual team will come to their own conclusions on, um, and I think like that's like certainly stuff like a lot of the things we talk about. We I think are fair. We we we've all been quite in in quite good agreement on, but as in they are factors. But if we were to try and like break down which one was the most important factor, I think there'd be a lot more back and forth over, uh, like oh this one's more important, that one's more important. Um, that Could you clarify what what is a factor? Oh well, I meant like you know the what we talk about safety and um, and and the different resources and pressure, all the things that we've been like breaking down the, the like the the building blocks of the theories. We I think we've mostly been agree, in agreement of, but the relative importance of each of those individual aspects is much harder to pin down because it it depends so much more on context. Um, if I were to be, to really, really nerd out here, I'd say we, we, I'd say if we like, you know, if we have a, a unified theory of team fighting, the standard model of team fighting that we've, we've worked out the parameters, but we've not got the coefficients. Um, so, you know, we, we know what, you know, X is, but we don't know what a times X if if if, the, if it's like team fighting, yeah, I'm being a nerd. All right, you're losing people. No, no. We're losing people. <laughs> I like maths. I make spreadsheets. Come on, guys. Like, what do you expect from me? You invite me on, you're gonna get maths. Yeah. Sorry. Um. You yeah. look at me. I'm, I'm I'm clearly clearly a nerd. So. Yeah, I think you made a really good point. Oh, and and honestly, I'm not even sure. Like if we can accurately answer what makes a good team fighter, but overall, I mean, very broad is just like have a lot of factors, right? Yeah, I mean, you you gave us the categories, and how many categories does my character fall in? How much can I do in each category? And if the answer is oh, I can do a lot in this and this and this and a lot of categories, then obviously I might be a good team fighter, right? Yeah, I think it's not like but boiling think... it down. If you go into detail and like deconstruct everything like we have been doing obviously it's complicated but what it boils down to is like j just look at it i mean everyone can say do i have a big hitbox i think everyone can identify that do i get hit a lot while doing so no because i have recovery cancels so i think it's pretty easy to just put your character into these 
Cade Gilgis. Yeah, I mean, they come, in, they come in practice, right? Like people try yeah. try them out. Um, so you, in the end of the day, like I think we've identified a lot of different things that what that make a character good at team fighting. But at the end of the day, they do need to actually function in team fighting, and that the only way you can really tell that is via experimentation with the character, play people playing the character, and finding out if they work well or not. I remember. What was the character that, that came out that we were thinking? Ah, it's when Kyoshin was first announced and they first showed off the moveset of Kyoshin. Everyone was like, oh, this character is going to be pretty good. And then the character came out and they had really horrible chain links and really bad recovery cancel. The, like, the, ti- the timings between things were bad. The hitboxes on some moves were really bad as well. And what looked really good on paper ended up being pretty bad. Until they quite quickly, and I got to commend the devs on doing that, fix a lot of those issues, and so Kyoshin's now a pretty good character um, by tweaking those things like the recovery cancels, the hitboxes, the chain links, that kind of stuff. So you need to ha- like everything on it. it you know, everything in theory needs to be played out in practice as well. So um, I mean, I think you can see it with BP, right? On paper might be untouchable in the team fight, right? Yeah. But every every time anyone argues no BP is meta, you have this big push from the comp scene. No, he's not, he's not, he's not. So uh, yeah. Okay, flashbacks to the tier list the yeah, 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 yeah. But it, earlier. No, you have this on paper of what's actually happening in game, right? Yeah. Yeah. To give a bit context about what Spaniard said, I was making a dominion tier list. And I was just thinking about BP on paper, and theoretically, I came to the conclusion that BP is S tier. And the reasoning for that was just because he was so powerful defensively that he would put everyone on the defense because attacking would be way less profitable. And you have your other teammates that you create opportunities for to attack. But we've seen many times in practice BP not working, and I just couldn't figure it out. But, yeah, think... but, 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 we have one of the best BP players in this conversation. Semix, could you tell us why BP doesn't work out? Oh man, there are so many reasons. And I'm also so glad this topic gets brought up. Uh, it's my favorite topic every time I talk about Foroner, I talk about this topic. Because it's also the topic I had with Legion and every single comp player. Because I've been one of those people that went, no BP must be good. He has to be good. He can do so many things. Come on, guys. And I forced Legion to play BP for a while to see that if it actually works out. And it did not work out. Um, it's just that there are so many factors in a team fight. So first of all, if you want to make BP work, you need to be incredibly good with your flips. You need to be incredibly strong defensively. And even if you are, even if you get your one flip, the likelihood of you, you know, getting more damage out of that than you failing the amount of flips is, you know, you will never win the damage in the end because you will most likely get one flip, get hit, hit one person for like 25 damage or whatever it is currently, and you will fail two flips and hit 30 damage for each. And, or you get you beat and then you eat even more damage. So... It's really not good. The character also lacks range. His safety is also dependent on the flip, which is not really that safe altogether because you can't just avoid it or chibi it. So he has no chase either. It doesn't work either. His feats are actually quite decent, but they're not enough in terms of, especially the tier, they're just not enough in terms of what they bring to the table compared to the other tier fours, unfortunately. All right. I think where we disagree is on how uh, safe we think flip is because for me flip seems very very safe like for example you said the fainting to gb well i see that very rarely happening because you open yourself for teammates to uh for bp's teammates to punish you but that that still happens people still gb you it doesn't have to be a gb it can also be a faint into a light well faint into a light seems like you have really good odds and just the fact that the opponent had to faint into a light to me means like he didn't attack your teammate. He means it means to me, John Jung fainted his wide sweeping unblockable that would have hit everyone to not make to not allow BP to flip him. So that even if you get punished, 
the fact that you prevented him to attack that just adds value to me yeah i think i would agree i just want to point out here real quick that i think your example is correct technically i just think that in practice too many flips get failed whether it's to f due to failed timings or whatever might else happen maybe they saw a wrong indicator or they get hit by someone else afterwards usually what happens is the punish the damage you gain from the flips is lower than what you get punished for in the grand scheme of things yeah i think what we also talked about which you mentioned as well in in the range and the mobility stuff is that it, the the a, a really good flip requires very good positioning and because bp is so immobile it's very hard for him to put himself in a position where he can flip so if let's say pirate had flip that would be you know ss plus tier whatever because pirate can go wherever pirate wants to be they will be there yo ho hoing away and then they can f and then right yeah they're gonna fail some flips they'll win some flips but they'll always be in a position where they can get the most value out of those and the least fa and the least risk if they fail them but bp so immobile can't put himself in those positions has to take risks for flips that aren't really going to be that good or more risky and then ends up losing out in the long run um, I think that's what one of the things we 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 put me and Toti and and uh, who else was with, with with us as well? I forgot now. Mina, Mina, of course. Um, persuaded Barak on, so he ended up not being an S tier. <laughs> <laughs> but but these are these are like the like really nitty gritty kind of. I I I think it's really interesting talking about these kind of things. You, you can you can see how BP could be so much stronger character with the addition of like one move. If they had a dodge attack that move, went a long direction, they would be, and the forward dodge heavy, I guess, went along further, they'd be insanely good um, because they'd be able to be in the position, position themselves to use their really strong tool much more easily. Um, I'm glad that Semix is nodding in the, in the background. Yes, like. Okay, so to me, it sounds, it. to me, it sounds like you have three factors in their formulas right now. You have safety, you have potential output, and then you have, how do I say this? Your ability to get that potential output, which is usually through position, which you need uh, moves that help you put in yourself in that position to reach that potential output. I would say there's, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm actually gonna draw a little diagram and hold it up to the camera now because that's that's what we're going, that's what we're going for now. I think, I think we've got, I think we've got the potential, which is the damage. We've got the peel, which is your ability to to you know stop people doing, it, and safety, and then you have got your mobility. What what is peel? Like? The pins, all is, of them. Isn't isn't peel like a byproduct of the other abilities you have? Like isn't peel, let's say, a byproduct of your uh, hitboxes range and speed because if you have a yeah, lot of those but I think that goes for all I, think some, right? I think there are some moves which are specific oh. appeal moves like um, but there we go here's, here's a little diagram okay. there we go um, those, are, those are the oh, four factors it, <laughs> everyone it. leaning in yeah. oh, those yeah. are the four <laughs> factors I think are the <laughs> important ones the most safety. important ones and ability underpins all of them um, safety power and what's the middle appeal uh, it's meant to be potential. I wrote power instead because I just said power and then wrote power. Okay. <laughs> safety, peel, power. Um, what is peel? What is peel? Yeah. Peel is safety. Peel is safety for your teammates. Yes, but this, we're talking about like an in, a character's individual move set. So peel, well, I agree, peel is safety for your teammate. If you're looking at one character on its own, safety is a different aspect to peel. So we have a move like. Um, vi Vi uh, Cobra Strike on on yeah. um, on yeah. uh, Ushi is very very good peel because it hits fast. It's got long range. It doesn't feed much revenge. And that's something we haven't really talked about revenge. Um, and she's got a dodge cancel, which makes it safe. But it itself is not a, uh, a, a offensive move because on its own, it's a light attack that could be externally guarded and is reactable and has no hitbox other than forward. So it's not. It's not a, um, a an offensive move, so you can't. It's a you defensive can't move. 
your hitbox is. Is it, is it, is it, is it defense? Yes, yeah. I consider peel defense. I consider peel as a, a counter attack to someone's attack. Okay, so maybe you could you could call them offense, defense, and safety in the middle of both of them. And okay, then... but this is like defensive offensive, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. But I'm trying to understand why you f you add peel in the formula because I think peel has a lot to do with potential rather than with uh, safety and what was the other factor? Your ability to reach that potential, which has a lot to do with mobility. Can can we talk about this one? I want to understand what this is. What is like the, the best example of VP, like where uh, VP has high potential, but very low, low what? Low so input got, to achieve that potential or? Yeah. So, well, we, we, it's, it's, I guess it's not safe and he has low, low mobility. So, well, safety, whereas... I mean, safety is, uh, uh, we disagree a bit on safety, but I think there is like an okay yeah, safety I mean, factor. Not, to me, okay. the biggest it, downside it, is like the fact that he cannot reach that potential power. I think it's safe. So it's safe. Flip itself is a risky move to go for. It's safe in your opponent if your allies are able to protect you, but that also requires positioning, which then requires mobility. So it requ also requires your opponent to play into it, right? If I target the person standing behind the BP with my big JJ unblockable, then I'm basically asking to get flipped, right? Yeah. So I'm yeah. playing into the whole playstyle from the BP. But yeah. if I just try and ignore him, let him do his thing on the side, then you protect that area. I don't care about that area anymore. I'll do something else. So yeah. all the potential the BP has is just stuck on that position, basically doing nothing. Yeah. Okay, and but that's not the problem with it, because yes, he does create very big potential in his small area of effect, and the problem is the opponent repositions, and while he repositions, BP is too slow to reposition himself again to achieve his exactly, maximum yeah. potential. So what yeah. is this factor called? What is this factor called which determines your ability to reach your maximum potential? I mean, is that basically what some characters yeah. are called noob oh, stompers and others thing. just don't work at high level? Just because if your opponent doesn't play into it, then all that potential is wasted. I think, I I mean, think I... that's the whole thing. So I guess if we can call we can call that if I'm gonna put this in I think my little uh, another piece. Oh, no, don't know. take her away. What <laughs> no, my, my stream lost entertainment. Oh, she's she needs a string, that's why. She's she's going after oh. Oh. <laughs> knitting in the background and, and 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 noodles is going after the threads and just eating them. Um so I've put another P for your potential here. Like that I think is the because you know we need more P's on this diagram. I think that is the the whole sum of this of this mm. equation is how good the the character is. The um, yeah. Of the potential, and that is part that is their offensive power, their defensive power, which you can call peel, how safe both of those tools are, and then mobility, which underpins all of them. Okay, so we have peel, safety, potential, and what was the fourth? Um, peel, so uh, well, let's let's not call it potential, let's call it offensive power. Okay, so Ooh, power... someone's taking notes. Yeah, it's got no oh, cut out. Holy crap! This is only this I, is only personal. I, I, I also want to write. I also want to understand. I like to draw. So we have power. You know, we're gonna have to peer review this. Um, potential. So your overall safety. character potential is equal to your character's. Uh, so your your team fighting potential is equal to your character's offensive power. They are, their defensive power, or their peel, because they're both basic, basically the same. Divided by. Safety. <laughs> Times by their safety of both of those things. D divided by mobility. So there we go. And we'll have, we have our nice little formula. Um, I, should have, I should have bought a blackboard, really, to be trying yeah. this down. Yeah. <laughs> well, yes. next, next, year's, next year's class will have improved this, the, uh, the curriculum. Oh. It's just come noodles at dinner time, so. Okay, so w what I wrote is that we have power, potential, and safety. And I tried to determine power through the factors we mentioned earlier with uh, speed, hitboxes, range, etc. 
I said that your power, which I call potential power, but that would be a bit confusing with our other term, but uh, your potential power is determined by your hitboxes, speed, and range. Now your potential is determined by your ability to reach this potential. And you reach this potential by positioning yourself in a place where you maximize that potential. So this potential should be something like mobility, shouldn't it? Or is there no, mobility any... Mobility enables the potential, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah so, so, so th that's what we want. We want to find something that, max that enables your potential. Because, like, for example, the problem with VP is that he lacks mobility. So his potential cannot be achieved or can be achieved for the short run. And there is a strategy that the opponent can implement, which is to say goodbye, mo move away, and VP has to catch up with him. But because he has less mobility, then he cannot reach his potential. So right now, for our master formula, we have safety plus potential power Plus be the mobility. Then. Yes, we're going to we're going to fill this paper by the end. It's going to be a one big formula by for Verona. Yeah, fax it to me. <laughs> what what else goes into Here we go. this is this is our formula. Potential is equal to here we've got your offensive and defensive things, the two of them combined, and each of them are times times by safety mobility. So there we go. Write that down, boys and girls. This is this is the thumbnail. Okay. And and who yeah. And if you and if you don't think maths is fun, just ignore it and play the game. I think we got a bit too theoretical. I think we need to step back and understand what the fuck we're trying to do. <laughs> what was our scope? What, did, what are we talking <laughs> about at this point? We wanted to come up with the standard model of teamfight, didn't we? Like, you know, the one that describes everything. And then you, you plug it in and all your numbers and you get your characters out and that's it. Being uh, fish bash bomb done. We're Game's trying, Yeah, we're trying to quantify how strong a character is, but I don't, I don't think we can do that. I, I think there are many factors and you need to understand what these factors do. And these factors' strength are literally relative to the other factors the opponents have. Yeah, so. but I think it's it's pretty good because like in BP's case, it's hard to like explain to people why is he not so strong. So breaking it down like you just did, I mean, I think it's a good way to do so. Even yeah. if it, it might be a little confusing, it might go a little bit too theoretical on some parts. But... I don't think the approach is wrong. I think the value of coming up with the uh, yeah that Kuhaku there has uh, has written down the formula. I think the value for that kind of film is not plugging numbers into it and coming up with okay this team fight this character is has a rating of S team fighting or this character is a D tier team fighter because of this formula. I think the value is that these are no, knowing that this uh, these are the factors that go into making a team fighter good that you can then look at a character and understand how you need to be playing your ca this character to maximize your effectiveness to make these factors all work work as well as possible and maximize your effectiveness as playing that character i think that's the value of it we don't we're not we're never going to be able to quantify uh you know the the actual strength of a character but what we can do is look at a character and say okay the character has all these tools that it, that in theory should work together because they have very good mobility and they have very good peel and they don't have great hitboxes, but because they've got such good mobility, it makes up for that, that kind of thing. Then we can, okay, they will probably be a good team fighter. Could you and translate you... that into a real game example where I identify my factors on my character, I understand what factor is strong and what is not, and I try to take advantage as, as much as well to maximize the potential output from my factors. Okay. So you are playing Shinobi. You are... You look at your character's moveset. They have got small hitboxes. So offensively, they can't hit lots of characters. Their offensive is going to be single target. So offensively is already going to be lower than the others. They have good single target... They have good defense for themselves because they've got a dodge bash. And they have good, decent peel because they've got good range on the lights. And 
they've got very high mobility and they're very safe because they can backflip after everything. So you having seen those, like that's how they all fit into the formula. You then need to, you're going to want to use the moves that maximize those properties when you're playing this character. And therefore you're not going to try and play Jean who is, you know, sorry, you're not going to try and play Shinobi the same way as you would play Jean who or JJ, because you haven't got, those big offensive hitboxes. You're not going to be trying to be going and hit people with your your side on dodgeballs to try and catch as many opponents as possible. That's not how you're going to try, try and play the character to be effective because that's not the tools the character has. Does that make That makes sense? very very good sense. I'm just very happy that from all our theoretical talk, we were able to come out with a practical conclusion that helps people understand how they should play their character better. I thought we would just ramble for no conclusion. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I'm glad you declared the podcast a success. Hopefully our viewers will also consider a success. success. Um, we've done a lot of nice beard stroking in general. So we, we you know, a lot of the thing has been done. Oh God, Nils has just had her food. So now she's in like zooming around every, oh my God. Zooming around everywhere mode. Oh, you didn't I see it. that cat in the thumbnail. Yeah, <laughs> she was the main guest of the show. She's the, she's the main guest. You can't you can't get me as a guest on anything without the cat coming along, because um, she rules our house apparently. Um, hey, what cats do. They, they do indeed. Um, yeah, I I hope you uh, enjoyed all. Uh, everybody else found that useful. Um, yeah, PS mod. That is the the good. That's the formula. Um, hopefully, you can look at that and then think how your characters fit into this framework, and then how you can play to maximize the effectiveness of the characters within within that framework. So, yeah, I think it was I think it was good. Good discussion. Um, I generally thought we'd probably just ramble off and and not get anywhere, but Barak, you did a good job keeping us all on topic. I enjoyed your insights, freeze and set mix. It's been very enjoyable. Thank you much for having me. Yeah, thank you very much all for coming. I am very happy yeah, we were time, able to host this. Thank you for having me as well. Yeah. I will stop the stream now and I will see you by my turn. Bye. Sounds good. Bye. Bye. Bye.